This is the story of Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates. It is a legend of warmth and adventure originally created by Mary Mapes Dodge. This exciting tale of the Brinker family is retold especially for you from Fisher Price. Water everywhere. That's what makes life as it is in Holland. People have learned to live with the sea. Rivers and canals are all around them. They adapt to the water, going by boat in summer and by sled and skate in winter. The sea surrounds Holland, and the sea is higher than the land. So the Dutch people have built earth walls called dikes to hold out the sea to keep it from flooding the land. Every Dutch family knows that when there's a storm, they must be prepared to work furiously to keep out the sea. And so it was for the family of Roth Brinker. Listen to that wind roar, might you? There's a terrible storm out there tonight. Have you brought plenty of peat inside for the fire? The wind is bitterly cold. Oh, yes, Ralph. Hans helped me bring in the peat blocks. Um, and we brought in everything that could blow away. Mama, Mama. Here, help me close these shutters. Oh, yes. Oh, I can hardly hold them against the wind. Oh, they have now fastened the bolt. Oh, I think we have some more now. Don't cry, Gretel. Mama's busy. See? The shutters aren't banging anymore now. Oh, Hans, you're a good boy. But, Ralph, you must have something to eat before you go to work on the dikes. The men will be here for you any minute now. Come sit down. I have your hot soup and your bread ready. Why do the men always come for you when there's a storm, Father? Remember what I told you about the dikes, Hans? Sometimes in summer, you build a sandcastle on the beach, don't you? And you build a wall around it. What happens if someone steps on your wall and breaks it? All the water comes in and knocks down the castle. That's what would happen to this cottage and all the others if we didn't have our dikes. We can never leave even the smallest break in them. Father, what would happen if the dike broke tonight? Don't be afraid, Hans. We won't let the dike break. We'll patch any weak places with sandbags and straw mats. You can be sure of that. Oh, Ralph, I'm always afraid when you're out there on the dikes. That work is so dangerous. You could slip and be hurt. Don't worry now, might you. If anything should happen to me or our cottage, remember, we have our money, our thousand guilders. Ah, uh, yes. Every Saturday night we put a few coins away. Copper, silver, even gold. And now our sock in the chimney place is almost full of money. Chimney place? Oh, might you? I must tell you that... Hey, listen, a... Ross! Here they are now. Here are the men. You! Get Ross Brinker now! Here is his cottage now! Ross! Ross, come on! The dike's in danger! Hey, will you bring your tools? No, oh, it's Broom Clatterboost, might you? I am coming, Broom! Uh, goodbye, Hans. Goodbye, little Gretel. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, Father. Help your mother now, Hans. I'll give each of you a ride on my shoulders when I come home. Goodbye, my dear. Goodbye, Ralph. Be careful now. The men hurried through the driving rain toward the broad wall of the dike. Suddenly, Ralph felt a tug on his arm. He turned around. Before him stood a young man with the palest, most frightened face he had ever seen. The boy spoke softly to him. Mister, please help me. You boy, what's the matter with you? You're scared to death. Are you afraid of the storm? I've done something awful. I must leave this country. Take this watch. I'm afraid I may be robbed as I'm traveling in the storm. Keep it safe for me. And in one week, mail it to the address inside the back of the case. And so saying, the boy disappeared into the blackness of the night. Stop, boy! Come back! What did he mean? Hey, Ralph! Come on, Ralph! I've got no time to wonder about this now. We've got to save the dike. I'm coming, young! When the men arrived at the dike, it was already beginning to weaken from the pounding waves and torrential rain. Ah! Here's where they got 
to work first, but the earth is washing away here. Let's get that scaffolding up. The men began building a wooden scaffolding or platform to stand on as they worked on the side of the dike. Finally, it reached a height where sandbags could be handed down to be pressed against the weakening ground. Let's get those sandbags in place. Rome, hand them over here. The scaffolding's so wet and slippery I can't hold on. We've got to hold on. We can't let the bank go. Men could hardly see through the driving rain and darkness. Sometimes the force of the wind was so hard that it nearly blew them from the scaffolding. But they worked on. Suddenly, Broom Cataboost lost his footing. Look out, look out, Broom, you're slipping! Look, look, the sandbags are falling! Get out of the way, Broom! Get out! Broom, are you all right? He's unconscious! Those falling sandbags smashed the scaffolding! He fell! He must have hit his head! You, young hooks, let's get these timbers off him! So we can get him out! You, you, and Starfall, you the rest, carry him about here at the dike! We've got to get rock ready and be warm and dry! Three men started off through the storm to the Brinker Cottage, carrying Ralph as carefully as they could. Dame, Brin- Dame Brinker, open up quickly! What is it? What's happened? Why are you back so soon? Ralph, well, what's happened to you? His head is all bleeding. Ma- Mother, what's hard? No, what's, what's wrong with oh, Father? What's hurt? happened to him? We're not sure, Dame Brinker. As we were working on the dike, I slipped and knocked a pile of sandbags loose. They fell and smashed the scaffolding. Ralph was working below me. He must have struck his head. He, he was pinned beneath the board. That's the way. Let's get him over here on the bed. Look, he's waking now. Oh, Ralph, Ralph, oh. are you all right? Oh, my head. The pain. Oh, Let me look oh. at your head. Oh, who Come. are you? No, I can't believe it. He doesn't even know me. Ralph, oh. Ralph, it's me, Marcia. Here, here's Hans. And and the Gretel, talk to your father, children. Father, remember, you promised to take us for a ride on your shoulders. Ro, Ro. It's no use, Dame Brinker. Something's wrong with his mind. I don't think he remembers anything. Maybe when his head, well, when his head heals, his memory will come back to him. At least he's alive, Dame Brinker. Be thankful for that. We'll go get the doctor now. Oh, Harry, please. I hope, I hope the doctor can do something. Goodbye, Ralph. Dame Brinker. Ralph, we'll be me. back with the doctor just as soon as we can get him. Yeah. So the men started off in search of the doctor. In the meantime, Dame Brinker tried to make Ralph as comfortable as she could. Now, here, Ralph, let me get your coat off. Oh, my head, it yes, hurts. He can hardly get his coat off. He struggles so. Uh, why, why doesn't he know us, Mother? Will he get well? Well, the doctor will tell us when he comes. Here, Hans, I have his coat off now. Now, take it and hang it up on the wall, please. As Hans took the coat... The watch given to Ralph earlier by the strange young man fell from the pocket to the cottage floor. Mother, look, a beautiful watch. It's silver. See, pretty watch. Don't touch it, Gretel, you might break it. Watch? Let me see it. It is silver. Wherever can your father have gotten that? It has initials engraved on it. L-R-B. Look, the back opens. See what's inside it, Mother. Dame Brinker opened up the watch and took out a small folded paper. She opened it and looked at the contents. It, it's in a foreign language. Looks like an address. I don't understand this at all. When Father is better, he'll be able to tell us where this watch came from. Oh, but uh, maybe people would think he stole it. Father didn't steal it? Well, yes, Hans. We know that Father would never steal, but... You see, when poor people such as we are are seen with a fine silver watch like this, people will wonder where we got the money for it. They might even try to put Father in jail. Oh, Mother, come on. Let's hide it right away so no one sees it. I know a good place. In the bottom of the dresser, under your best dress, where for St. Nicholas Eve. Yes, yes, you're right. I think we should hide it. But don't let Gretel see where we're putting it. She's too little. She'll go and get it out to play with it. So Hans and his mother quickly hid the silver watch in the bottom drawer of the dresser. Later that evening, when Hans and Gretel were asleep, Dame Brinker sat before the fire, thinking to herself as she waited for Ralph's friends to return with the doctor. Suddenly, she remembered Ralph had said something about their savings. 
just before he left to work on the dikes. Quickly she rose and went to the hiding place in the brick chimney. We'll surely need our savings now. Ralph will need medicine. The doctor must be paid. And there'll be no one to work while he's sick. And let me see. Ah, uh, this, this was the brick right here. Dame Brinker pulled out the loose brick and reached inside for the old stocking bulge with coins. She found nothing. Frantically, she pulled on the surrounding bricks, thinking she might have the wrong one. Nothing here? It can't be. Oh, I must have pulled out the wrong brick. By mistake. <sighs> but this is the only brick that's loose enough to be pulled out. Oh, it is the right place, and the money is gone. One thousand guilders gone. And all in a day. Someone must have come in and stolen it. What will we do now? When the doctor arrived, he gave Ralph medicine to cure his fever and the cuts and bruises on his body, but there was nothing he could do for Ralph's mind. The blow on his head had injured his brain so that he could not remember his wife, his children, or his home. And what he said didn't make any sense. In ten years' time, Hans was fifteen years old and Gretel was twelve. Because the family never found their missing money, they were very, very poor. Ralph Brinker was, of course, not able to work to make a living. Dame Brinker earned a little money spinning, knitting and growing vegetables. Hans and Gretel did all the outdoor work and the housework, too. They went out every day to gather peat for the fire. Sometimes, to earn a little extra money for the family, Hans rode the horses that towed the boats on the canal, and Gretel tended geese for the neighbors. The children's clothes were thin and patched. Some of the schoolmates laughed at their shabby clothes and poor cottage, but Hans and Gretel were cheerful children nonetheless. In the winter, during the noon recess from school, many of the children spent the hour skating together on the frozen canal. Hi, Peter. Hi, Hilda. I hear your father's giving a grand skating race for your mother's birthday. When is it? Next month? Yes, it was all my idea. Anybody can enter. Hilda's father was the rich burgomaster or mayor of the village. As they heard talk of the coming race, more children joined the group. I hear the prize for winning will be a beautiful pair of silver skates. Silver skates? Oh, boy. I'm going to win those. Don't be so sure, Peter. You know Hans Brinker skates like the wind. Not a chance. Those old wooden skates he and his sister Gretel use are the silliest looking things you ever saw. The Brinker children did indeed have queer looking skates. Hans had made them of clumsy pieces of wood. The children tied them to their feet with straps of rawhide. In spite of this, they spent many happy hours on the ice. They were as good skaters as any of the children in the village of Bork. Better go faster, Gretel. I'm going to catch you yet. Oh, no, you're not. Listen to your skates. They're beginning to squeak. You are right, Gretel. They're wet already. They always get damp and stop me short, so I trip. Same with mine. But at least we can skate for a while. Who's that skating over there? It's Hilda van Gleck. She's so nice, but she's very rich and her father's the mayor. She can't be coming to see us. Looks like she is. Hello, Hilda. Hello there, Hans and Gretel. I wanted to tell you both about the grand race and ask you to join. You're both good skaters. It doesn't cost anything. Anyone can enter for the prize. Oh, no, we can't. Our skates are only hard wood. They get wet and trip us. Could we come and watch anyway? Hilda wished with all her heart that she could help Hans and Gretel. Please take this money. I have only eight coins, enough to buy one of you a pair of skates. I only wish I had enough to buy more. We can't take this money from you, Hilda. We didn't earn it. See the wooden chain around your sister's neck? Carve me one like that. You can give it to me for the money. And before the children could even thank her, Hilda was gone. They argued over who should have the new skates. Oh, what good luck. If Mother sends us to town tomorrow, you can buy your skates in the marketplace. No, I earned the money, Gretel. I'm spending it on wool for a jacket for you instead of on skates. Oh, Hans, don't say you won't buy the skates for yourself. I'm not that cold. I feel awful if you give up the skates. It was a hard thing for Hans to decide. He wanted very much to enter the race and see if he could win. But he knew that with a week's practice on a good pair of skates, Gretel could beat any girl in the village. Finally, 
He made up his mind. No, if you won't take the jacket, Gretel, you must take the skates. I may be able to save enough money one day to buy a fine pair myself. Now that settles it. Suddenly, before Gretel could say another word, they saw, skating in the distance, the famous surgeon, Dr. Bookman. He was well known for both his skill in medicine and his crotchety and unfriendly personality. The children had talked of him many times. They thought maybe, just maybe, if the great Dr. Bookman would only see their father, he would know how to cure him. But he was a busy man. And it was not likely that poor people such as they could ever see him. Gretel, it's the great Dr. Bookman. He's skating this way. Oh, it's him. I can't believe it. If only we could speak to him. You do it, Hans. Dr. Bookman looked grim and forbidding. He was thin and lanky with stern blue eyes and tightly closed lips. Hans was terrified of him. But he knew that the money which Hilda had given them for the skates might pay for Dr. Bookman to see his father. This gave Hans the courage to skate up to the doctor as he passed by them. Doctor, do, Doctor Bookman, I have to ask you something. Get out of the way, boy. I have no money. Never give to beggars. But I'm not a beggar, Doctor Bookman. I want to ask you if you can come to see my father. He's been sick for a very long time. His body is well, but his mind is sick. He fell on the dikes when I was a little boy. For ten years he's been the same. He doesn't know us, and his words make no sense. And what's that you're saying? At the mention of Ralph's illness, the doctor stopped and began to listen. Hans told him the whole story of Ralph's accident on the dikes and of his long illness. Oh, please do come and see him. I know you could cure him. This money I have is not enough, but I will learn more. I will work for you for the rest of my life, if only you will come to see my father. Suddenly, unbelievably, a smile appeared on the cranky doctor's face. He put his hand gently on Hans' shoulder. I'll see your father, my boy. But it is a hopeless case, I'm afraid. How long did you say it had been? Ten years, Doctor. Uh, it's a very bad case, but I shall see him. Now, let me think. Right, right now, I'm skating to Leiden. I'll return in a week. Uh, then you can expect me. Where is your home? It's a mile south of Broke, near the canal. It's not... It's only a poor, broken-down hut, but any of the children around here can point it out to you. I shall be there. Now, goodbye. And so saying, the doctor skated off. It is a hopeless case, but I like that boy. His eyes remind me of my son Lawrence. Yes, he's... he's very like him. Gretel had waited excitedly while Hans and the doctor talked. Hans, Hans, what happened? What did he say? Did he say he'd come? I can hardly believe our good luck, Gretel. Yes, he did. He said he'd come in a week. Oh, I can hardly wait. I just know he can cure father. But Hans, he's a very famous doctor. It must cost a lot of money to have him come. Listen to this, Gretel. We can sell the silver watch in the dresser drawer. I'm sure it would be enough to pay Dr. Bookman. Sell the watch? Oh, Hans, we couldn't do that. People would think we had stolen it. They might put us in jail. No, Gretel. If it will cure father, we must sell the watch. Oh, children, look. Your father is worse. Help me get him into bed, Hans. Uh, then you must go for the doctor. Mother, today as we skated, we met the great Dr. Bergman. Hans told him about father. He said that in a week he'd come here to the cottage to see him. Oh, Gretel, we can't wait a week. Mother, I'll skate to Leiden to get Dr. Bookman. Maybe he'll come soon. Oh, but Hans, your skates, they aren't good enough for such a long trip. They'll stick when they get wet. I'll get there, Mother. I have to. Father may die if I don't go. It was a very long trip for Hans on those poor homemade wooden skates. And he couldn't go very fast because of all the people on the canal. Whole families were traveling together on skates. Business people were taking cheeses and fish to market. There were horses pulling sleds. And there were even huge ice sailboats on runners. Oh, if I could only go faster. There's so many people. I'll never get to see Dr. Bookman. Hans didn't see the huge ice boat. Under full sail, it raced down the canal toward him. Suddenly, Hans looked up. He saw the red and gold prow almost upon him. You boy, watch out! Hans closed his eye 
Flash a huge boom with its tail whisked over his head. It passed within an inch of him, but he was safe. Hans was coming close to the town of Leiden, but he was getting more and more tired. It was a very long journey. It had taken him hours. Now he began to hear that sound he dreaded, the squeaking of his waterlogged skates. Just once in a while at first, then more and more often. Oh, if I can just get to there before my skates stick. There's the tower of the town clock. Now to find where the inn, where Dr. Bookman stays. I'll ask this man. Sir, do you know where the Golden Eagle is? Well, first turn your left, boy. Thanks a lot, sir. I must be almost there. As Hans rounded the corner, his squeaking skate stopped short at last. He tripped and fell sprawling on the ice. Quickly, he took off his skates and ran down the last stretch of canal to the door of the inn. Yes, boy? Sir, I must see Dr. Bookman. He said he'd be staying here. That man's as cross as a bear, even to me. He'd never see you. Be on your way now. But he promised to see my father, and now he's dying. I must see him. I've skated all the way from Broke. You're wasting your time, but tell you what I'll do. I'll let you leave a message for Dr. Bookman. Come around to the kitchen door. Oh, thank you, sir. So Hans wrote a note explaining all that had happened since he and Gretel met the doctor on the ice. He begged him to come at once. Then, after drying out his waterlogged wooden skates by the kitchen fire, he began the long trip home. When he arrived, the cottage was sad and dark. Raff lay moaning on his rough bed. Dame Brinker bathed his forehead. There was nothing left to do but wait for Dr. Bookman. Do you think the doctor will really come, Hans? I don't know. If only he gets the message. The innkeeper said there were many people waiting to see him. Oh, he's got to come. Look Whoa. at Mother. She hasn't closed her eyes. Whoa. Mother, please lie down and rest. You're so pale. Your eyes are all red. I'll stay with Father. No, Hans. I must stay with your father until the doctor comes. The children sat waiting on their wooden stools. They had stopped talking. Through the broken and patched window panes, they could see it was getting dark again. The firelight flickered around the bare room. At last, there was a knock at the door. Oh, Hans, answer the door quickly. It may be the doctor. Dr. Bookman, you did come. Now let me see your father. Is worse, you're saying? Dr. Bookman examined Raff while Hans and his mother told him the whole story of Raff's long illness. Then he spoke. Now listen to me. I'll operate, but you must make the decision. The operation could kill your father. But I strongly believe that it uh, will cure him. This is an old illness. Something is pressing on his brain. It's become worse and worse. And the operation may save him. Yes, now, now, now talk with your mother, boy, and, and let her decide. My time is short. Hans and his mother stood by the window talking in low tones. Then Dame Brinker knelt beside Roth's bed. Gretel threw her arms around her mother's neck. Well, Dame Brinker, shall I operate or not? Will it be painful for him? Probably not. Shall I operate? But you say it may cure him, but there's a chance he'll die. That is what I said, but I hope it will cure him. Now come, Dame Brinker, I have other patients to attend to, yes or no. The doctor is waiting for an answer, Mother. Oh, all right. I give my consent. Good. Now let us get started. The doctor opened his leather case and began to take out the shining instruments. He laid them on the stool beside Roth's bed. Now, Dame Brinker, you and the girl must leave the room. The boy may stay and help me. I'll need an assistant. No, I'll stay with my husband, Doctor. Well, I usually don't allow it, but I'll let you stay. The girl must go. Now, you remember, you must make no sound no matter how you feel. Gretel was terrified. She grabbed her hood and ran out of the door. She crouched in the shadow of the cottage. As she huddled there in the bitter cold, she began to feel very sleepy, as though she were floating in the air. She began to see strange things. Hans and the doctor climbing the cottage roof. 
Or was it Hans and her mother? The stork's nest on the chimney seemed to rustle and whisper to her. She seemed to hear the sounds of birds singing. Those must be winter birds. Icicles are all around me. Hear the birds, mother? Wake me for the race. Suddenly, Gretel felt a hand on his shoulder. A kind voice seemed to come from a distance. Get up, Gretel. Get up. What are you doing out there alone in the snow? You can't lie here and freeze. Slowly, Gretel raised her head. She saw Hilda van Gleck leaning over her. Hilda shook her roughly. She began to drag her along the ground, making her walk. Gretel, break her. You must wake up. If you go to sleep, you'll freeze to death here in the cold. You've got to walk. Soon you'll be warm enough to go by the fire. Now let me take you into the cottage. Oh, no, no, we can't go in there. The doctor's there with Father. He sent me away. Hilda started to the cottage window. Can you see anything? Yes, there's your father. He's lying very still. His head is covered with bandages. They're all looking at him. Gretel, you mustn't be afraid. You can go in now. Oh, thank you, Hilda. Quietly, Gretel slipped into the cottage. The room was very still. Suddenly, as they all stood watching, Ruff's hand twitched. He raised it to his forehead and felt the bandages in a puzzled way. Everyone held their breath. Then, slowly, slowly, Ruff's eyes opened. He spoke. Steady, steady. Shift that mat higher, boys. Now throw on the clay. The waters are rising fast. No time to... Ralph, Ralph, speak to me. Is that you, Maitje? I've been asleep. I've been hurt, I think. Where's little Hans? Here I am, Father. Here I am. Silence, he must have quiet. Is the baby asleep, Maitje? The baby? Oh, Gretel, that's you. And he calls Hans little Hans. He's known nothing for ten years, and he thinks the children are still babies. Quiet, he must not get excited. I've done all I can for now. You give him no food today, I'll come again tomorrow. Oh, God bless you, Dr. Bookman. How can we ever repay you? Gretel! Go get the watch. Quickly, Gretel ran to the drawer where the silver watch had lain hidden for so many years. She opened the drawer and took it from beneath her mother's Sunday dress. Here it is, Hans. Dr. Bookman, take this silver watch. You can sell it for a lot of money. Hans! That watch? Here, let me see it. Where did you get it? I can't believe it. Yes. Yes, it is the same watch. Look at the initials on the back. L.R.B. Lawrence R. Bookman. It belonged to my son, Lawrence. Oh, he disappeared ten years ago without a word. But how did you get it? It it fell from Roth's pocket the night he was brought home senseless from the dikes. We've kept it hidden ever since for fear someone would think we had stolen it. There's an address in the back. Open it up, Dr. Bookman. Why, this address is in Birmingham, England. I'll look into this right away. It may be possible that I can find my dear son, Lawrence. Oh, I've searched for him for ten years. He was my assistant. By mistake, he prepared the wrong medicine, a deadly poison for one of my patients. Fortunately, I discovered the mistake. You mean Lawrence thought the poison had killed him? Oh, I'm afraid so. He ran away. I've never heard from him in all of these years. Oh, I hope you'll be able to find him now, Dr. Bookman. If I find my son, you will have repaid me a thousand times over. Well, I must go now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you, Dr. Bookman. And so Dr. Bookman departed, leaving the overjoyed family to be together for the first time in ten years. Raph grew stronger every day. His family clustered around him, happy to bring food or a blanket. They talked of all the things that had happened while he had been ill, and very gradually, his memory returned. (laughs) 
And Ralph, though he felt saddened at having missed so many years with his family, was a very happy man. The only cloud over the happy family was their missing money. They needed it badly for food and medicine. They felt Roth might be able to give some clue to its disappearance, and yet they dared not press him to remember things too fast. Meanwhile, the day of the grand skating race drew closer and closer. The whole village was bustling with excitement. How Hans longed for a pair of good skates. Gretel knew how much he wanted to be in the race. She felt badly that she would be the only one able to enter. Oh, Hans, these skates you got me are wonderful. Just look how fast I can go. It's almost like flying. I know I'll do well in the race, maybe even win the silver skates. It was just like you to be kind and spend Hilda's money on me, but I just wish you had a new pair, too. So do I, Gretel. I think I'd have a good chance of winning, but you'll just have to win for both of us. I know you can. If only Father could remember something about our money, but we can't upset him. Dr. Bookman said so. Look, someone's coming. It's Peter Van Hope. Hello, Peter. Hans, I've been looking all over for you. Remember the beautiful carved wooden chain you sold Hilda? Have you got another one you could sell me? I want to give it to my sister. I sure do. I'll go get it from the cottage. I hear your father's well again, Gretel. That's great. Are you going to be in the race? I sure am. I can hardly wait. Here's the chain, Peter. I hope you like the design. I do. And I'm sure my sister will love it. Thank you, Hans. Now take this to pay for it. But, Peter, that's much more than the chain's worth. I can't take so much money for it. That's not true. It's worth much more than that. Besides, I think my father can get you a job carving on my uncle's summer house when he sees this. I have to go now. Goodbye. I'll see you at the race. Well, all right. Thanks a lot, Peter. Oh, boy, Gretel, look. There's enough money here for me to buy skates, too. I'll be able to skate in the race after all. Hooray! Hans went to the marketplace the very next day and bought himself some new skates. Now both children practiced harder than ever every single day. One day, as they came inside from the ice, they overheard Raf talking to their mother. They couldn't believe what they heard their father saying. Might you, it's a good thing you had our savings. It gave you something to live on while I was sick. It's a lucky thing I told you all about it before I fell. Told me about what, Raf? Told me about what? Why... That I buried the money, of course. Do you hear what he's saying, Gretel? We've got to be careful not to excite him. Do you remember where you buried the money, Father? Yes, my boy. It was just before daylight on the same day I was hurt. Jan Kamphuisen said something the night before that made me distrust him. He was the only person besides Mother who knew we had saved a thousand guilders. So I got up that night and buried the money. I'll bet you've forgotten where you buried it, Father. <laughs> Not I. Oh, no, indeed. But uh, good night, son. I'm very sleepy now. Good night, Father. Where did you say you buried the money? I was only a small boy then. Why, right by the small willow behind the cottage. Oh, yes, the north side of the tree, wasn't it, Father? No, the south side. Now, fix my pillow, please, Gretel. Oh, good night to you, children. Good night, my dear. Good night, Father. Good, Good night, Ralph. He's gone to sleep. Oh, I can't believe it. Quickly, let's go search for the money. Come on, Hans, help me. You stay with Father, Gretel. The moon was full as Dame Brinker and Hans stepped out into the night. They took a spade and Ralph's old icebreaker and headed for the willow tree. In the bright moonlight, they could see the tree distinctly. When they reached it, they began to dig. The frozen ground was as hard as a stone, but they managed to dig a foot deep on the south side of the tree. Hans, I can hardly wait. We may find it any minute now. Strange that he put it so deep in the ground. I suppose it was soft enough then. Hour after hour they dug on until the moon and the stars faded away and the streaks of daylight began to appear. They had searched thoroughly all around the tree, south, north, east and west. I'm afraid it's no use, Hans. 
The money just isn't here. Wait a minute, Mother. This tree is too small to have been here when Father buried the money ten years ago. He must have met the old willow stump over there. That stump is the old willow tree. The one that you cut down because it shaded the potatoes. That's the tree that was a sapling when Father buried the money. Oh, you're right, Hans. Quick, 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 let's try over there. Tired as they were, Hans and his mother ran over and began to dig on the south side of the old willow stump. Look, Hans, my old stone pot! Hans reached in his hand and took out a piece of brick, then another and another. Then he pulled out the old stocking, and then the pouch, black and moldy. He emptied the pouch, and there at last was the long-lost treasure. Here it is, Mother! It's here! Oh, we're rich! I can't believe it, Hans! At last, we have our savings after all these years! Come, Mother, let's tell Gretel! Carrying the old pouch full of coins, they hurried excitedly toward the cottage. Ralph was asleep, and Gretel tended the fire as they came in. Gretel, look! Our money, it was there! Oh, Hans, I... Shh! Quiet, Gretel! Father mustn't know that we didn't have the money all those years while he was sick. It would upset him too much. You're right, Hans. We won't tell him. Come on, children. Tonight we'll have a wonderful supper. Cold meat, soup, bread, and jelly. We don't need to save the delicacies for Father now. We have plenty of money to buy more. At last came the day of the grand skating race. It was a beautiful, cold, sunny day. The icy canal sparkled in the sunshine. News of the contest had traveled far and wide. Everyone was there, dressed in their holiday best. There were costumes from all over Holland. The crowd was tremendous. Some boys and girls even had to stand on stilts in order to see over the heads of others. Vendors sold donuts, candy, and pipe tobacco. On the edge of the ice, in a red and white striped tent, decorated with greens, were the Van Glecks, the sponsors of the race. There were similar tents for the other rich and important families. And there was even a band. A half-mile stretch of ice was marked off by flagpoles. The skaters were gathered by the poles waiting, 20 boys and 20 girls, practicing eagerly for the race. The crier announced the rules. The girls and boys will take turns racing until one girl and one boy has won two races. They will skate the half mile to the flagpole and then come back to the starting point, making one mile for each run. The girls had the first run. Twenty girls moved into line. A white handkerchief dropped by Madame Van Gleck was the signal to start the race. Then a bugle blast. Gretel had won the first round. The girls rested while the boys took their first turn. Minheer van Gleck dropped the handkerchief this time. They're off! There go the boys! There's Peter! He's ahead! No! Hans is passing him! Oh, Peter's got to win! Hans is winning! Come on, Hans! Look! Carl Schmoo! Where'd he come from? Oh, no! He's ahead! He's won! Carl Schmoo! One mile! For the second time, the girls fell in line, ready for the signal. At the sound of the bugle, they were off. This time, Katrinka and Hilda were in the lead as they rounded the half-mile flagpole. Uh-oh, Gretel's behind this time. Come on, Gretel, come on! Hilda's winning. Yeah, she's in. Looks like she's first. Hilda Van Gek. One mile. Now the boys raced again for the second time. Hans and Peter were both in the lead, but Carl was trying desperately to pass them. If he won again, he'd win the silver skates. Come on, Hans! Don't let Carl win again! Come on, Hans, you can do it. Peter Von Hoek, one mile. For the third time, the girls lined up. The third race could decide who won the silver skates. The crowd watched breathlessly as the girls waited for the bugle to sound. <laughs> Now everyone watched intently as the girls reached the half-mile flagpole and turned to skate back. 
One girl could be seen ahead of the others. At last, the crowd could make out the girl in the lead. It was Gretel Brinker. She was determined to win. And she did. The crier's announcement of the winner couldn't even be heard this time. The crowd went wild. Everyone crowded around Gretel. You won, Gretel. Congratulations. Well, thank you all. You'd better get back to the boys' race, Hans. You'll miss it. Oh, wait a minute. Look at Peter. Something's wrong with his skate. He's not back with the others. Peter was kneeling down, bent over his skate. He seemed to be working with a strap. What's wrong, Peter? Are you in trouble? Well, Hans, I guess I'm finished now. I tried to tighten my strap by making a new hole, and the knife accidentally slipped and cut the strap almost in two. Here, Peter, quick! Use my strap! Oh, no, Hans, I can't do that. Hurry to your place. The bugle will sound any minute. Peter, we're friends. Now take this strap, quick. There's not a minute to lose. Come on, Peter. Hans, come on. We're all waiting for you. Hurry up! Look! Mrs. Von Gleck is motioning to you. Be quick. There. The skate's almost on. Fasten it. I couldn't possibly win anyway. The race is really between you and Carl. You're a good friend, Hans. Thanks a lot. Peter rushed to the line just as the bugle was sounding. They're off. Oh, no. Carl's in the lead. Not anymore. It's Ben. Oh, come on, Peter. You've got to win now. The band struck up a lively march. Peter led a procession, doubling in and out of the special gaily decorated arches set up for the grand race. In and out the skaters snaked, almost like a living creature. Finally, at the sound of the bugle, they stopped in a double semicircle before the Von Gleck Pavilion. At last, the winners were to receive the long-awaited prize, the Silver Skates. There's Madame Von Gleck. She's getting up to present the skates now. The winners of the silver skates, Gretel Brinker and Peter Von Holt. And so saying, Madame Von Gleck handed each one of them a pair of dazzling, sparkling silver skates. Oh, they're beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Madame Von Gleck. They're the most beautiful skates I've ever seen. Oh, Hans, let's go show Mother and Father. Quickly. Gretel darted through the crowd to their waiting mother and father, followed by Hans close behind. They hugged her and kissed her. Oh, Father, I'm so glad you're well enough to come to the race. Aren't the skates beautiful, Mother? Oh, they certainly are, Gretel. Just see how they sparkle in the sunshine. You always were the fastest girl on skates for miles around, and now you'll be even faster. Oh, oh Hans, I'm only sorry that you couldn't have won, too. But you did an unselfish and brave thing, giving your strap to Peter that way. Maybe something nice will happen to you, too. Look, here comes Dr. Bookman. He's got someone with him, a younger man. Welcome, Dr. Bookman. Did you see the racing? <laughs> oh, indeed I did. Congratulations to you, Gretel, and to your family. It's thanks to you, Dr. Bookman, that I could be here today with my family to enjoy Gretel's great success. Well, I have something to thank you for, too. Thanks to you, this is a great day for me. May I introduce you to this young man I have here with me? This is my long-lost son, Lawrence. Oh, we were reunited this very morning, thanks to the address in the back of the watch case. Oh, he's come back from England to live here permanently. He closed the leather factory he operated there and is going to open a warehouse here. Oh, yes, we're so glad you found each other at last. But isn't Lorenz going to be your assistant again, now that he's back, Dr. Bookman? <laughs> no, I think he'd rather be a merchant. And which brings me to the point I've been trying to make. Hans, I'm getting to be an old man. I'm going to need a successor as well as an assistant. How old are you, Hans Brinker? Fifteen years old, sir. Well, you were brave and helpful the night I operated on your father. Would you like to become a physician? Yes, sir. Well, would you be willing, with your parents' consent, of course, to devote yourself to study, to go to a university, and in time to be a student in my office? Oh, yes, sir. Well, then, all we need is your permission, Ralph. My son's a studious boy. I think he'll do well in medicine. All we need is the money. But now that I'm well again, I'll soon be able to earn it. Oh, 
come, come now. If I take your boy away, I must pay the cost, and I'll, I'll be glad to do it. It would be like having two sons, eh, Lawrence? One a merchant and the other a surgeon. Oh, and Brinker, my, my son Lawrence will need a trusty, ready man like you when he opens his warehouse. A job will be waiting for you with a very good salary. Well, I've grown up working on the dikes. It's the only way of life I know. I'd hate to leave it. But for my family's sake, I'm afraid I can't turn you down. I accept your kind offer. See, Hans, I knew something great would happen to you, too. Oh, this is really a joyous day for us all. The silver skates, hanging from Gretel's arm, flashed and sparkled in the sunshine, throwing rays of light across the happy faces of the Brinkers and the Bookmans. Ten long years had been lost to both families, but the years ahead would be good ones. <laughs> <laughs>